appreciative of them. Uh, for me, if there's one thing that patients are upset about losing, it's their game ready. Uh, so I highly encourage you guys. Uh, it's a great icing unit, compression unit. It's great for patients uh, after surgeries or if you just need to cool them down for a little bit. So I'd really consider getting that set up. Uh, lastly, need to thank Danielle. She's organized this talk now for the last couple of years. She's got a great database and name list. Uh, so anybody who does not get an email from her, I'd encourage you to sign up with her uh, to make sure that we can have your name for future talks. Okay? Uh, so when, I guess my only disclosure is I do work with Smith & Nephew currently. Uh, divide, decide, uh, we design some instruments and we also do some education for them. That doesn't really have any impact on this talk at all. Goals tonight, I'm going to backtrack again, just like we do every time. We'll go through FAI again for new people, labral tears, kind of go through how I come up with the diagnosis and confirm that that's the problem. Uh, and then I'll just kind of look at what's changed in the last year. We'll go through all of that. I want to follow up on uh, the GONS osteotomies that I'm doing in conjunction with Ron Hugate. He's really the one that's doing the GONS osteotomies. Uh, he's brilliant at the surgery. I'm very impressed with what he's been able to do with that. Uh, I do the hip arthroscopy portion first. Then I'm going to get into labral reconstruction, the rationale, how I got here, uh, why I do it, and what our results have been. Uh, and then lastly, uh, Joe is going to close the talk. He's going to talk about his experience. Uh, and I, I, for me, this is, that's the meat of this talk, and I think that's what you guys will find the most useful because I'm not a physical therapist. I, I can't pretend to tell you how to rehab. I can just tell you the pitfalls that sometimes I see, uh, and hopefully that will be helpful for everybody. So uh, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to look at your neighbor front, back, and side. Uh, and uh, pat each other on the back. Uh, we are way better than we used to be a couple years ago. I think everybody's doing a great job at picking up these injuries. Uh, and it's been very, very helpful um, uh, to get people earlier. I think it's made a huge difference. Now, that being said, we just had a gentleman that I just said goodbye to tonight uh, who has had two failed back surgeries and um, a couple other procedures, including a spinal cord stimulator for what was a hip problem the whole time. Uh, and so uh, he was actually dismissed by a spine surgeon and told that you're probably just depressed. And so I, I hope that everybody out there kind of takes that to heart, takes that story on, and, and uses it as a motivation to get better. Uh, last person I forgot to um, uh, thank and really introduce is Sean Carnes. So he's actually uh, my new PA. Uh, he's been with me now for a couple months. Uh, he's great. So the nice thing about having him is we get in the OR a little bit more. But then also, uh, if you need us at any point, you give a call and you'll get Sean through me or vice versa. Uh, and so we're much more accessible than I used to be when it was just me. So we're more efficient. I think we're a better team now. When you look at impingement, what is impingement? Again, there are the two types. There's the cam and the pincer. Cam is basically an aspherical femoral head neck junction. And so when you rotate that ball into the cup, it just simply doesn't fit. And that poor labrum on the very front is what gets whacked. That's what gets torn. That's what hurts. But it's the underlying impingement that caused the problem in the first place. The pincer is the same problem, just simply on the cup side. The cup in the front is simply too prominent. So the same thing. We live in flexion as we flex our hip up. That's what we impinge against. That's how you tear the labrum. Either way, this conflict, whether it's cam or pincer, whether it's both, it's a conflict with anterior hip flexion and internal rotation. Okay? Now, when we look at the etiology and presentation, I really think that everybody is unique. You know, we're all blessed with the genetic heritage uh, in a certain construct. And then as we develop the sports that we play, can promote the development of further impingement. For example, ice hockey or soccer, all the twisting and pivoting that goes through with that can make the impingement actually worse. When we look at the distribution, uh, CAM probably is 25%. Pincer in isolation is pretty rare. The mixed pattern, 73%. I actually think it's a mixed pattern in almost 100%. Because if you have impingement, these labral tears don't start just one day. Symptoms may, but you've had the impingement for several years leading up to it. So there's going to be some element of bony change on both sides of the joint, which worsens the situation. In other words, if you have a pincer for a long period of time, you're going to develop a reactive cam. If you have a cam for a long period of time, you'll develop some reactive osteophyte on the front of the cup. You'll get a reactive pincer. So the two go together. Um, when you look at the timing of symptoms, um, uh, this is one of the big problems that I think we have in, in Colorado. It's really the activity level or type of sport combined with the degree of impingement that brings about the problem. So in other words, if you have a massive degree of impingement, and a relatively inactive person, you might see them pretty early. Usually what we see is relatively minor impingement and then psycho young athletes. You know, we had this one guy who's about 5'8", uh, who's very active, very athletic, but he thinks he's going to be able to play D1 college basketball. So he's doing squat thrust, all these different things, and he brings about a problem that we might not have seen for a very long period of time. And that's the nature of our current society. Maybe a problem for us. I don't think we're going to change anything with that. 
but that's what's keeping us busy with the hip uh, quite a bit. When you look at the labrum, this is basically an extension of cartilage that goes from the very bottom um, all the way around to the other side. This is the transverse acetabular ligament on the very bottom, okay? So the transverse acetabular ligament, nobody really knows what it does. It just sort of keeps the bottom of the horseshoe of the cup together, uh, especially with development. I think that's probably when it's important. But either way, the labrum goes from roughly the 430 position on the clock to the 730 position on the clock all the way around. And so that's just like this. Now the hard part about the labrum is that it's very highly innervated with nerve fibers, so it's very sensitive. So once it gets bruised, torn, or anything like that, that's when it becomes symptomatic. And when you look at the cross section, when we cut this in half um, uh, and we take a good look at it, you can see here's the ball right here. Here's the rim of the cup. This is cartilage in pink, and that extends into the labrum. You can see that over here. Ball, edge of cup, cartilage blending into labrum. These black squigglies are the blood supply. And so with orthopedics, the simplest way to think of things is where the blood supply is poor, that's your weakest section. So right here on the articular side right here is where we call the watershed zone. That's the area where the blood supply is not great. This is the area that's most vulnerable to injury. Unfortunately, when you tear your labrum, you're going to injure the cartilage on the edge of the cup here to some degree. And that's why a lot of people believe that a labral tear is the beginning of an arthritic process. Okay? And so that's why we like to intervene early. I do not operate to protect the joint. I do not operate to preserve the joint. I think that's a secondary benefit. I operate for symptoms. When people have the symptoms of justifying the intervention, that's when we talk about surgery. This is my workhorse. Uh, it's called the anterior impingement maneuver. What you do is hip up, you adduct it a little bit across the midline, you internally rotate the foot. This is a little counterintuitive. You're bringing the foot out, but that's internally rotating the hip. And I scour it. Okay, so it's sort of an anterior impingement scour. I take them through that range of motion. In 100% of my patients that I operate on, I reproduce their pain, whether it's in the groin, whether it's in the thigh, whether it's in the butt, whether it's in the side. This is my workhorse, okay? We have a paper that Andrea is working on uh, talking about our diagnostic algorithm that we use to kind of decide which patients would benefit from the surgery. This is an awesome test. It should be part of every, every one of your screens for sports hernias for hamstring tears, for lower back, well, maybe not lower back, but anything around the hip that you're worried about, this is just a wonderful screen to put in place. Now, it's not 100% specific, but it's at least something to keep in your mind. When you look at the label tears, the majority of these are not one-time event. It's not like when you're skiing down that double black diamond chute and veil and you twist your knee and you tear your ACL. This is something that, you know, training for a marathon, I started developing some hip pain in May, June it got progressively worse, yada, yada, yada. That's the way these things progress. Uh, and so it's rarely a one-time injury, unless it's a car accident or a high-end injury where they could have subluxed their hip joint. Sometimes we'll see that. <clears throat> Almost all, and I'd say nearly 100%, have some element of femoral acetabular impingement. Uh, it's very rare to have a labral tear without impingement because I think the impingement chronically weakens the whole system and then eventually they tear their labrum. Symptoms, the classic location, people will say this, I hurt right in here. That's the C sign, okay? It's classically in the groin. It's also down the front of the thigh to the knee. It's also in the side. It's also in the buttock. Those are the four classic locations. It should never go past the knee. Okay, if it does, you've got to think about the lower back. It's usually worsened with use, but people don't like sitting for long periods of time. They'll sit for a long period of time. They go to stand up. They feel like something's caught. They get stiff. Uh, they don't <clears throat> like to pivot or twist, but they're okay walking straight. But as soon as you ask them to change directions too much, they have a problem. So if you're trying to cool somebody off, it has a symptomatic labral tear. Sometimes just kind of getting them to work like a robot for a little bit sometimes can be very helpful. Um, <clears throat> when you take a look at the MRI, we all look at this as our gold standard. This is the best way to diagnose it. I agree. It's the best way to visualize it. However, <clears throat> it's not quite as good as it's reported. It's reported to be s sensitive in picking up about 90 to 95 percent of cases. But I do think it misses a lot of tears, particularly in our adolescent women or really, really flexible women. In that situation, we get wave signs, uh, and I'll, I'll show that in the next si slide. But if the point of this is if you get a negative MRI, particularly if it's a garbage MRI, uh, an open MRI, a low Tesla magnet, when we have the measures of the magnets, you need to have a 1.5 Tesla or better. Some places have a 0.2 Tesla. It's garbage. You look at it, it's, it's highly speckled. You can't really read it. And so if you have an MRI that says it's normal, it, really query that. 
Because if you think it's a labral tear, it probably is. You just need to prove it to yourself. When we look at the joint, what's this wave sign? So what happens is, in really flexible people, they're kind of like a green branch. You can't break it, okay? And so instead of classically tearing the labrum right at the junction between the labrum and the capsule, what they do is they get this really hyper-flexible situation here. I'm going to click on this video one more time so you can see it. I think that should work. So what I'm doing is I'm pushing on the labrum here, and you can see <clears throat> the cartilage inside of it right through here is bouncing, okay? And so that's basically where the cartilage and labrum are injured together. Now, the way I repair that uh, is I basically will pass a suture through the cart cartilage labral junction and repair that whole thing to retighten it. I, I've learned with time, especially with doing the labral reconstructions, taking down the labrum, this is actually a very, very bad injury uh, because it's almost better if you just tear the labrum completely. A lot of times with the wave sign, what you get is you get an intrasubstance delamination to the cartilage. And so this is probably a little bit more significant than we think. Uh, that being said, our repair technique, we have about 350 wave signs, I think, maybe almost 400. And this repair technique has worked very well. I don't like to put thermal treatment near it. Some people will thermally treat it. It stiffens it, makes it look pretty. But the problem is you're probably denaturing the cartilage to some degree, so I prefer the non-thermal treatment. This has worked very well for us. Label preservation, this is absolutely the move. Uh, I think label debridements are good in only a very small subset. We're learning through all the presentations and the guys that are able to do the basic science work that it, it, it makes a seal around the ball that keeps the joint fluid in the joint. Cartilage maintains or gets all of its nutrition through diffusion. So it gets it all through the sponge effect of compression, taking all the joint fluid in and out. We need that seal to maintain uh, 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 the fluid within the joint. And so that's very, very important for the cartilage life and health. Stability. <clears throat> it also increases the surface area of the cup and it, 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 it forms that tight seal around the ball that helps for stability. So what we find is when we distract a hip, um, and they did this study, they found that you didn't have to distract with that much force if the labrum was torn, where if it was still intact, it was harder to distract it. We also know from a cartilage protection standpoint that if you don't have a labrum, you're going to get increased cartilage wear with time. And I'm going to show that in the reconstruction set. What happens if you think about it, cartilage likes compression. It likes to be compressed. It does not like shear. That's why with ACL injuries, when we pivot, shift, and twist the knee out, we injure the cartilage because it doesn't like that shear force. When we have a ball in a cup, that edge of the cup from the ball rotating in and out is going to constantly see a shear force. That labrum serves as a bumper to diffuse that. That's not been proven yet. I'm sure that is something that's very important. That's just hard to scientifically prove. <clears throat> For me, uh, this is my workhorse in the operating room. Virtually everybody gets a femoral osteoplasty. You can see this preoperative radiograph. This is a kid who's a hockey player. He had zero internal rotation because he had this giant door jam in the very front of his joint, and he couldn't rotate against it. And so what we ended up doing is a femoral osteoplasty here, and you can see the difference in the level of satisfaction, VAS, pain score, Harris hip score, compared to where he started. This provides a couple things. Number one, we get a natural spherical uh, femoral head neck junction which is helpful um, uh, for the overall environment of the hip to protect the work that we're doing on the inside. Uh, but also, it creates a lot of bleeding in the joint. And that's helpful uh, overall to, um, uh, uh, to get everything to heal. It also can uh, compensate for a very subtle um, uh, acetabular irregularity. Because if you, if you, sometimes you don't always see the pincer as bad as it is. And so it can be helpful if you get the the ball properly shaped, it can compensate for something in the cup that's just not perfect. So this is definitely my workhorse. Everybody gets this. <clears throat> when you take a look at this, so a lot of people come in, and Sean can vouch for this. Today we saw a bunch of people, and they say, hey, I've got a label tear. Do I have to fix this? Okay. In most situations, I say no. You don't have to fix anything. You fix it if it bothers you. Now, the hard part is when we get this type of a cam lesion, there was a paper that came out that said almost 100% of very severe cam lesions have a very high association of lateral cartilage full thickness injuries. And that's what you can see in this slide right here. You can see that we have a full thickness cartilage injury peeling off the edge of the cup right here. And so I'm a little bit more aggressive at telling somebody, you know, this is probably something that you should get fixed if it's pretty, pretty significant. Now, when you take a look at this, uh, we get a lot of people come to us for second opinion if they've already had surgery. This was an open procedure. You can see the nice layout of anchors 
space pretty evenly through here. Uh, the problem with this is once you do it open, you pop out the ball, you're staring at it. It's hard to know exactly where to begin. And I, we do a ton of these. And so I, I say, do I start here with the femoral osteoplasty? Do I start here? Do I start here? I really don't know. I don't have an ability to check x-ray when I'm doing an open procedure. And sometimes you end up with this. This is a problem. <clears throat> I don't know what to tell patients with this. They have a very irregular femoral head neck junction now that's highly unnatural. Now, are they going to have clearance? Sure, they're going to have clearance. But are they going to have too much clearance? I don't know. I prefer the natural approach. I think when you do it open, very easy to over-resect. Um, when you take a look at this, this is the second part of the procedure. This is the acetabular rim trimming. Um, uh, what you can see is here we have burred the rim of the cup. We get some that are awful. So this is a massive pincer. This, this cup actually rotates around the ball. <clears throat> and you can see that pretty significant right here. So that's a pretty nasty, egregious pincer. Right here, we basically have resected them back to a lot. Now, the power of the labor reconstruction is we've actually been able to uh, be very aggressive on the cup and get a lot more of the damaged cartilage resected and a lot more of the pincer resected. 